Perfect. Hey, so guys, before we formally dig into what we're doing today, which involves a ton of learning and yet minimal notes, I'd like to gather around the calendar with you for a second and just share a couple sort of, not deadlines, but mileposts in our month. So, guys, your papers were due on Friday, um, and then, as I said, if you would like to turn them in Monday, you were welcome to do that. I got a bunch of papers yesterday, which was great. Um, but now, guys, literally about 20 minutes ago, these, these left the building. Um, they are no longer here. Uh, the BYU graders came and picked them up. So guys, if you still haven't turned in your paper, I'm frankly not yet sure what to do. Um, Miss Colin, I haven't really figured out a protocol for what to do if you haven't turned your papers in. We can't send them to BYU. We're not exactly sure what to do. We'll take them from you eventually. We'll just have to grade them in-house, but we haven't really figured that out. So if you brought them with you, hang on to them. We'll talk more on Thursday. Um, then, guys, please remember that if you're doing remediation, today is the second and last opportunity for you to come to the after-school session. Remember, you need to have watched the video, taken notes, done the assignment. So when you come in, we will take from you your video notes and that assignment. Without those, you're not engaged in the process and we're just going to ask you to go. And then you guys remember that on Thursday is the essentials test. If that doesn't work for your calendar, please talk with me. And then guys, do you know what's going on with the football game? Have people talked with you about this? You're a, or I hear Gimpy in the hall. So guys, the deal with the football game is originally we were going to cancel school on Friday so that we could go to the game. But the district came back and said that there's a new policy which says we can only cancel school for the championship game, which means we will have school on Friday. You're welcome to go to the game if you want. It just means that you're going to have to check out and uh, we're still going to continue with those eight day classes. You'll just have to work with your teacher. So, guys, that's the scoop. Questions about calendar, questions about remediation papers. We're good? Okay. Then, guys, grab that notes-taking sheet that you've got in front of you, and let's talk. Um, let me pull this up. So, guys, here's what you're going to do. On this notes page, what I want you to do is draw a horizontal line right about where that second hole is punched. So see where it says energy level? And then above that is the table. Draw a horizontal line that separates the two. Okay, then what you're going to do is this. Above that line, write something to the, the, the order of bore model dies. Guys, everything above this line is why the Bohr model is not complete. So it's sort of the death of the Bohr model. And guys, you'll notice you've only got two terms that you need to define relative to that, and then some words to fill in the box. Then guys, below that, down below the line, um, I would encourage you to write down for next time. And guys, that then provides us the opportunity to talk about the way today is going to go. So what we're going to do is in the next 15 minutes, we are going to kill the Bohr model of the atom. We built it up during the flame test lab. And guys, today we're going to tear it apart. We're going to talk about why is the Bohr model of the atom very, very insufficient. So guys, in 15 minutes, your little atomic world is going to be laying in shambles on the floor. Then guys, what we're going to do is this. We are going to fill in the blanks. Literally, we are just going to run through this and fill in the blanks. And what we're going to do, and guys, this is going to be super confusing. Just wait for it. We're going to fill in these blanks down here. And at the end of that, you're going to be saying to yourself, I have no stinking idea what any of this means. And that's good. So this then is what we're going to do with the rest of the day. We're going to do homework. 
And guys, all of the answers to your homework are on this page. And here's the promise I make. This is going to be confusing. But if you can answer these questions, then you understand what you need to understand to be ready for Thursday. So guys, this homework assignment is going to be like a big warm hug that's going to reassure you, even if you're confused, that you know what you need to know. Do you understand how we're going to proceed? Okay, so guys, in the next 15 minutes then, let me grab my writing utensils and I'll lay out for you the way this is going to go. So guys, we have got, again, two goals for today. So guys, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take this Bohr model of the atom and we're going to rip it apart. We are going to talk about why the Bohr model of the atom was nowhere near reality. And then, guys, what we're going to do is this. We are going to begin to plant the seeds for the cloud model of the atom. That's what that table, that outline is at the bottom of your page. But again, guys, these are just going to be the seeds. We're not going to let them flower into reality until Thursday, but we need to trust the process. So again, guys, just to be absolutely clear, I don't know if this is going to let me do this. Uh, it's not. It's drawing dots. Um, so guys, just to be absolutely clear, this then is how this is going to proceed. Today, these are our only goals. We're going to figure out why the Bohr model is not complete. It's incorrect. And then guys, we're going to gather that information that we need to create a better model, but we're not going to completely build the model, just plant the seeds. You guys good to go? Okay, now guys, look down at your notes page. There are only two definitions that you need to know for today. Heisenberg uncertainty principle and probability. Guys, those are the only things you need to write down in the next 15 minutes. So the idea here is, guys, engage in the conversation. When it's time to define the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we will. But guys, in the meantime, we're just going to talk about how this all came about and how we ripped apart the Bohr model of the atom. And then, guys, we're going to collect these building blocks. So, guys, this is the idea. You should understand this. So let's talk. So, guys, Bohr figured out his model by studying the light that is released by electrons. Talk with the person next to you about what you learned in lab that connects electrons and light. Talk with the person next to you for a moment. Guys, you got about 20 more seconds. You guys okay? Brandon, go ahead. Oh, did you not get one? Um, who else came in late? Um, did you get one? Dang. Did you just come grab it? Did I? Oh, I get it. Brandon, I'm sorry. There you go. All right, my fault. So, guys, eavesdropping on your conversations as I was sort of listening, and these guys are closest, so it's the thing I heard first. I heard these guys talking about fall length. I heard the words length come out of their mouths. And, guys, it's critical that you understand this. So, let's review... And if any of this doesn't make sense, guys, please ask questions. So this is the way the lab went last time. So guys, you were handed bottles of metal atoms. And those metal atoms, electrons, were in their lowest energy state. And what do we call that lowest energy state? Ground state. And then, guys, we add energy to those electrons. And how did we do that in lab? Bunsen burner. And those electrons jumped up to a higher energy state, which we call what? 
Excited state. So now we've got these electrons in an excited state, but they can't stay there. And the moment they have the opportunity, they fall back down to their ground state and they release that energy in the form of light. Now guys, light has colors that are related to wavelengths, but let's talk about colors. So guys, if an electron goes through a short fall, it's going to release low energy light. And what color is that? Red. And then if it's a light fall, it releases high energy light, which is violet. And we've got Roy G. Biv that describes all the falls in between. You guys good? Okay. So guys, that is how Bohr came up with this model. But along the way, this was going to become the Achilles heel for Bohr's model. Guys, in the Bohr model of the atom, what he's doing is he is literally tracking electrons like little particles. And these particles are moving around the nucleus. And then they jump up and then they fall down. And so guys, in order for the Bohr model of the atom to work, we have got to be able to track these little particles moving around the nucleus. We've got to know where the electrons are and where they're going and where they can be and where they can't be. And so guys, as Bohr developed this model, remember the letter N. He used a single variable to describe the size of these orbits and he went, okay, here's the nucleus and then we've got this first orbit and you may have learned in biology that it can hold two electrons and then we've got the second orbit. We call that N is equal to two and you may have learned in biology that it can hold eight, which is true. And, oh, sorry, and then it just builds on and on and on from there. So, guys, this is functionally the Bohr model of the atom. Are we good with that? Questions about this and the connections to light and excited and ground and wavelength and color. That all sitting okay? All right. So guys, this is where this starts to get messy. Grab your pen, it's time to write. So guys, Bohr is chasing down this research in the early 1900s. Everything's going great. Bohr's getting all this great data about colors and light and energy and where the electrons go to and fall from and all this other stuff. And this is going really, really well for about a year. And then, guys, Bohr started getting all of this lab data as he was trying to make more and more careful measurements. And, guys, his data started to fall apart. Bohr was in crisis. He's gathering all this data, and this data is suggesting that these electrons maybe aren't as simple as he thought they were. And, and so at first, Bohr just thought his data was bad. So when a scientist thinks their data is bad, what they do is they publish it. And so Bohr published his data, and he sent his data out into the community, and a guy named Heisenberg, and guys, this is in your notes, a guy named Heisenberg grabbed a hold of Bohr's data. And Heisenberg, they say, was one of the greatest mathematicians that's ever walked the face of this earth. And guys, Heisenberg grabbed a hold of Bohr's data, which was starting to get weird. And guys, he said something life-changing in a paper, but also personally to Bohr. He turned to Bohr and he said, Bohr, your data is not wrong. Your data is actually really, really solid. It's not experimental error. The problem with your data is that you're, and this is really how he said it to Bohr, you're asking questions that electrons don't allow you to ask. And Bohr was like, what on earth are you talking about? And so Heisenberg's response to Bohr was, electrons don't allow you to figure out where they are and where they're going. Does that tickle your ears a little bit? We heard that a lot in these videos we watched. Guys, electrons don't let you do that. And there's nothing like that in your existence. I think we talked about this. If you were to look out the window and look at 4th East, if you saw a car, you know where it is. And you could then follow that car and know where it's going. Guys, that's what the Bohr model required, but Heisenberg said that's impossible. And he said it this way. You need to write this down. It is impossible to know 
where an electron is and where it's going at the same time. If you know where it is, you don't know where it's going. And if you know where it's going, you don't know where it is. Now guys, we have the advantage of years of scientific discovery that built on this. You already know the answer why. So here's where we are. Bohr studying electrons like particles. His data gets weird. Heisenberg said this is not going to work. He said electrons don't let you study them as particles. You can't know where they are and where they're going. Guys, here's the question I'd like you to ponder based on what you've learned a little bit in the last couple days. Why do you think that's true? Why can't we know where electrons are and where they're going? Chat again with the person next to you. Why can't we know? Why can't we know where electrons are and where they're going? I like that you stated it as a question. It's safer. I like it. Keep going, y'all, if you need another moment. Oh my gosh, totally. Yeah, I mean, electrons are unlike anything anywhere. They're crazy. So guys, can we pull it together? Is that okay? <laughs> I like the response. Electrons hurt my brain. They hurt all of our brains. But guys, I don't want to call you out individually because the minute I go, James, what did you guys talk about? Then everybody else is off the hook and James is on the spot and I don't love that. Um, but guys, would you be willing to share? What did you talk about in your groups? Why can't we know where electrons are and where they're going? Come on, yeah. I love the word spontaneous. We're going to replace it with a different word, but what do you mean by spontaneous? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're stubborn and crazy, right? Yeah, they're, they're nuts. Guys, other things you chatted about. Why can't we know? Yeah. All right, so now we need to add this idea of waves, right? So let's talk about that again in a second. Guys, other ideas that play into this idea that we can't know where electrons are and where they're going. You okay? Or, James, I would like to know what you guys were talking about. Okay, can you share any of them? Yes, don't lose that thought. Keep going. Uh, they also can't exist until they show up. Right, right? Yeah, so all of a sudden, all that craziness from that video comes back, right? Like they can travel from here to here with traveling through the space in between. They pop into existence out of nowhere. They can travel through all possible paths. They're, what was the spontaneous? These things are crazy, nutty, weird. And Jackson, now we got to deal with something about waves, right? Guys, these are unlike anything that you've ever, ex you can't even imagine the way these things work because there's nothing in our existence that actually replicates the things that electrons can do. And guys, this is where we get into a weird spot. What do we do if we want to learn about something that we can't actually visualize or replicate? And guys, the answer is we are left with models and we're left with analogies. So guys, let's, let's dig into this one layer deeper. So here's where we are with Bohr. We fundamentally, and guys, this needs to be in your notes, we fundamentally understand that Bohr's data was not bad. Bohr's model was bad.
So guys, then the question becomes this. What was bad about Bohr's model? What didn't work about Bohr's model? And guys, for right now, we're just going to let it sit at this. Guys, what Heisenberg said to Bohr is, your math is good, your science is good, your model's bad. There is something fundamentally unusual about electrons that doesn't let you study them as particles. And guys, that fundamental thing is everything you just talked about. They don't exist until we look for them. And then they pop into existence, and then they leave, and then they show up somewhere else. And sometimes they behave like Jackson waves. Sometimes they behave like particles. Guys, electrons are so completely, your word, spontaneous that we can't study them in ways that work in our bigger world. So guys, that's all the deeper we need to go. Are you comfortable with the idea that the Bohr model wasn't barking up the right tree because fundamentally electrons are not simple little particles revolving like the, the planets around the sun and that's not what they are and therefore they can't be studied that way. Does that sit okay with you? Now guys, make this connection. Who said that? And you need to know that all of that ties to Heisenberg and what is called his uncertainty principle, which is like spontaneous. We use the word uncertain, but we can't know with certainty where an electron is and where it's going. So guys, big deep breath. This is a turning point in history. We okay with the idea? So what happened next? So guys, the Bohr model of the atom is wrecked. We now know that electrons can't be studied as particles because they're not particles. And we had a whole lot of really smart people scratching their brains. Einstein, Bohr, Compton, all of these really, really bright, De Broglie, all of these really bright guys are going, what the crap? We don't have a model anymore. We don't know what atoms look like. We have no direction to pursue with research. We are completely stuck. So guys, who saves the day? Schrodinger. So guys, listen carefully and you're going to see the next word in your notes in just a second. So here's what Schrodinger said. He said, all right, I get it. Bohr was trying to study electrons like particles. That didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because electrons aren't particles. And so he said, Heisenberg is right. We can't study them as particles because we never can know where they are and where they're going. So this was the brilliance of Schrodinger. Schrodinger said, if we can't know that, let's stop trying. And rather than trying to figure out where an electron, all, and notice this subtle change, be ready to write, here's what Schrodinger said. He said, rather than knowing where an electron will certainly be all of the time, what if we allow ourselves to know where an electron probably will be most of the time? Do you see the next word in your notes? Guys, this was the brilliance of Schrodinger. He said, rather than knowing with certainty, let's talk about probability. And guys, probability is the ability to know where an electron is most of the time. And Jackson, just as a little aside, this is what the wave thing is all about. Because it turns out that the volumes that electrons tend to be in, probability, are shaped like waves. So guys, I need to let your eyes acclimate to dark. So guys, people then came to Schrodinger and he said, all right, draw us a model. What do you think an atom looks like? And Schrodinger started to draw things like this. Guys, you've drawn these before. What do the dots represent? Go ahead. Say it again. Well, let's, let's, so it is probability, 
But for our model right now, this is going to be hydrogen, so it's only one electron. When you get into multi-electron systems, it gets even worse. But So it is a probability. But guys, let's make sure you're clear. This does not represent 100 electrons. This represents one electron. And this does not represent the path of the electron. This electron is not going boop, 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 boop. Guys, this electron is jumping in and out of existence. And those dots represent where that can happen. Does that make sense? Then I have a question for you. Guys, you need to understand the analogy for this to make sense. So how do we make these plots? And this is the idea. Guys, imagine that my countertop is a piece of film. And imagine that this is an electron. And imagine that when I turn on this strobe light, and guys, I need to ask just to be careful, if you have seizure disorders that is triggered by flashing light, um, you may just want to close your eyes during this. Um, it gets a little flashy. So guys, this is the idea. When we are looking at this picture, here's what we're looking at. We are looking at kind of like a piece of film that is being exposed by flashing light. And we have an electron that casts a shadow on the film. And so guys, here's my question. As this electron moves through, this, through space, if the Bohr model of the atom was correct, what would we see on the film? Circles, right? If the Bohr model was correct, we would see circles. But we don't. The model that we envision then is this. This electron is here and, and here 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 here, 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 moving randomly, here, here, here. You'll notice it was never over here, but it was here and here and here and here and here and here and here. And guys, when we develop that film, what are we going to see? This? Do you see the connection? Then guys, here's the question. What if we allowed this film to be exposed over the course of a day? What would the film look like then? Say it again. It would all be dark. Would it be dark out here? No. Where would it be dark? In the middle. And guys, that's the idea. This is the way that we envision electrons. So guys, electrons are not huge solids. But this is weird. They behave as if they're huge solids because of the random movement of the electrons around the nucleus, which are confined to spaces, described as waves, where we most likely find the electrons. Guys, this is a radical new way to think of electrons. This is literally how we envision them. Guys, electrons are clouds. But electrons aren't as big as the cloud, but electrons behave as clouds because of their random in and out rapid movement around the nucleus. But guys, do you understand this is what creates the illusion of solid? Remember our model of the atom. If the nucleus is the size of a, of a marble, how big is the atom? Football stadium. And where are the electrons? in the cheap seats. Guys, atoms are mostly empty space and therefore they shouldn't be solid. This is what makes them solid. The electrons, because of their random probabilistic movement, create these spaces, these volumes that appear to be solid when in fact all they are is the probability of electrons moving out of existence. So you're going, wait a minute, all right, this is, this is nuts. What you're telling me is that electrons behave as if they're solids when in fact they are just points popping in and out of space in these areas that we call electron clouds. And guys, that's exactly what I'm telling you. 
But if you don't like that idea, guys, I would suggest to you that it's not that weird. Guys, let me show you what I'm talking about. Where's my button? Oh, boom. All right, we need a dark room. So guys, this is the idea. And as I said, there's nothing like this that you've ever experienced, so we're left with analogies and models. So guys, this is going to be our model of the atom. Let's make it as dark as we can. Oops. So guys, this is going to be our model of the atom. Glad that didn't close. So guys, if this is our model of the atom, what's this? The nucleus. And what do the fan blades represent? Electrons. Now guys, we know that atoms are mostly empty space. And because we know that atoms are mostly empty space, we know that things can then travel through them. So guys, if the fan blades are the electrons, and normally this goes really poorly, and I didn't practice this morning, so be gentle. Guys, I can show you the space between the electrons. Ooh, that was good. <laughs> yeah, all right. Because I can fire, it's left side, not too bad. Guys, I can fire rubber bands between the blades of the fan, showing you that there is empty space between the blades. Are you guys all sold on that idea? But guys, that's not what electrons are doing, right? Electrons are moving randomly, chaotically, in and out of, in and out of, uh, in and out of existence. Sadly, I couldn't find a fan where the blades magically come and go. Be kind of cool, but I can put them in motion. Do you see where this is headed? Guys, is there still space between the blades? Yeah, but guess what? It doesn't behave that way. This thing now behaves like a solid, and I can't shoot rubber bands through it anymore because the blades are moving. Guys, the same thing is going on in atoms. These electrons are moving in and out of existence like the fan blades moving around the center. Oh, that was cool. It got blown off. Um, guys, kind of like the fan blades, they, they are moving and therefore behaving as if they are a solid. But is there still space between the blades? And if you don't believe me, I can show them to you. Again, if you have seizure things, close your eyes. Hold on, we're going to go this way. Here we go. Guys, you see the space between the blades, right? And this doesn't quite sync up so that I can completely make them freeze in space. But guys, you can clearly see the space between the blades. The space, this is falling in and out of sync. Guys, the space is still there. But it doesn't behave as if there's space between the blades because they're in motion. Just like electrons have space between... Oh, there we go. The, it's just like electrons behave as if there's space between them. Or they, they have space between them, but they don't behave that way because they're jumping in and out of existence. Do you see the analogy? By the way, guys, how does this work? How does this allow you to freeze the blades? Do you know, Adam? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So, guys, did any of you watch the second video from the videos we watched that I told you you didn't have to watch, the one that was Hank Green crazy? Guys, if you watched it, this is what this was about, and it's actually about what are called harmonics. So this is how this works. So guys, what's happening is right now, the light is flashing at the same speed that the fan is rotating, which is 30 times a second. 
So this light is flashing 30 times a second, and every time the light flashes, the blade is returned to the same place it was when it got lit up a 30th of a second ago. So every time the light flashes, the blade is in the same place, and it appears to not be moving, kind of, because it's returning to the same place. But then, guys, we can then do this. And if we go up to 60 hertz, it freezes again pretty close. It's not perfect. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, one more. No, come back. Come back. Come. There we go. And so, guys, the idea is that now it's being illuminated twice per rotation. But, guys, this is cool. We can start chasing this. And these are what are called harmonics. So here is, oh, let's see if we can find it. Ah, we're close. This is actually half a step above, where now it's being illuminated twice per rotation, but it's not quite in the same place. <laughs> this gets cool. There are a couple here that I think are really pretty. That one's cool. Right? <laughs> It does look like a flower. But again, the idea is that these, these fan blades are moving, behaving as if they're solids, even... Oh, wait, this one's cool, too. I like that one. That's 243 flashes per second. If you look at it, it looks like it's just glowing because it's flashing so fast, your eyes can't catch it. When, in fact, you can see that it's freezing. <laughs> this one's even better. That one's cool, right? And it's all about, as you said, Adam, synchronization and harmonics and harmonies, which ties back to music, guys. There's all sorts of interesting connections here. So, guys, at the end of the day, here's what we know. We can't figure out where electrons are because they actually aren't particles moving through space. They're flashing in and out of existence. And as a result, we've got to talk about probabilities, which allows us to figure out where the electrons probably will be. Be. Big deep breath. Because, guys, that's it. The Bohr model's dead. Do you understand the progression? Bohr studying electrons like particles. Heisenberg saying that's not going to work. Schrodinger coming along and saying that's fine. Let's not treat them as particles. Let's treat them as probabilities. And as a result, we now have this model of the atom that allows us to figure out at some level where these electrons are and what they're up to, but not with certainty because electrons don't behave that way. Thoughts. You okay? Okay. So guys, one other thing to write down under probability and then you're done taking notes. The probability model of atoms treats electrons as if they occupy the whole space rather than being points along a path. And guys, as a result, we needed to give these spaces names. And we call them electron clouds or orbitals. And guys, we're going to use the word orbital. I would, well, we're going to use the word orbital. So guys, when you're done writing down the orbital, the word orbital, you're done formally taking notes. You guys all caught up? You okay? Okay. So guys, when you hear the word orbital, your ears should have twitched a little bit. Because in the videos that we watched over the last couple days, we've talked about, you've heard the word orbital. And guys, if you don't remember when... It was here. This is actually a screen capture out of the Hank Green video, the one that we did watch, where he talked about S orbitals and P orbitals and D orbitals and F orbitals. 
And guys, these orbitals are the cloud-like structures where electrons probably will be found. But wouldn't it be nice if we had a place where we could actually turn and visualize these better? Guys, that's these. That's all of this. That's what this stuff is all about. That's what you probably will be doing for extra credit after Thursday is creating the shapes of the clouds, the S's, the P's, the D's, the F's with the spider web. Guys, that's the connection. These clouds actually look like this, and these are the places electrons probably will be found. So guys, this then provides us the opportunity in the next 10 minutes to wrap this up. So guys, we are now going to put the death nails in the Bohr, the Bohr model. Guys, you have a table and it looks like this. Guys, fill this in with me. So what's wrong with Bohr? And why is the Schrodinger's model better? Well guys, fundamentally, Bohr was treating electrons like particles. And that doesn't work. Guys, the better model is to treat electrons as if they are described as being in spaces that look like waves. That's the orbitals. So guys, why was this necessary? Well, the reason is because the Bohr model was just too simple. It was based on what we knew about physics in the 1900s, which was about planets and orbits. Didn't work. We need something more complex, because electrons are complex. See, guys, the Bohr model was based on a solar system, because that was the physics that we knew. But it turns out electrons don't behave like planets in orbits. They behave like clouds, described by waves. And guys, when we start thinking about electrons in this way, instead of talking about orbits, what do we talk about instead that sounds very similar? Orbitals. Got rubber bands everywhere. So guys, when you think about orbits, you're thinking about a path. But path doesn't work. We need to be thinking about not paths, but another P word, probabilities. So guys, at this point, it's important to remember that Schrodinger and Heisenberg did not do any experiments. Einstein hated it. He said it was bad science. Guys, neither of these people did an experiment. It was all math. And when you have math, you have variables. And so in the Bohr model of the atom, he had one variable, n, which described the size of the orbit. That's this stuff. And you don't need to write it down, but remember n is 1, n is 2, and so on. Well, guys, it turns out that what Schrodinger did was added more variables to describe the complexity. He took the N from Bohr, which was size, and he added L, M, and S. Okay, so guys, at this point, we have like eight minutes left. We are now going to cross the line, literally, right? The Bohr model's dead. We're now ready to go down to the bottom and we're ready to pick up the pieces. See the fill in the blank uh, outline? We're going to fill in the blanks. So guys, remember N, L, M, and S. And here we go. Looking at our outline, guys, the energy level number is N. This tells us the size of the level, the size of the cloud. 
And again, guys, if this gets confusing, if you can do the homework, you're fine. So guys, how many different cloud sizes are there? The answer is seven in our universe. And therefore, on our periodic table, there are seven different cloud sizes. It goes from one to seven. Now, how many electrons can go in each one of those clouds? And the answer is the 2n squared rule. So guys, please don't write this down. Just follow the logic. How many different cloud sizes can there be? Seven. So one through seven. How many electrons can they hold? That's the 2n squared rule. So guys, plug in one for n. What do you get? Two. One squared is one times two is two. Don't write it down. What if we plug in two? Two squared is four, double that is eight. Plug in three. Come on, guys, this is like seventh grade math. Three squared is nine times two is 18. We plug in four, four squared is 16, double that is 32. Five squared is 25, double that is 50. Six squared is 36, double that is 72. Seven squared is 49, double that 98. So guys, this is how many electrons can go in each one of those clouds. Does the math make sense? Okay, then guys, this. As the value for N increases, and guys, we're just scratching it in our notes. As N goes up, the size, energy, and capacity of these energy levels also increases. Again, guys, we're just jotting stuff down. Wait until Thursday when all of this stuff comes alive. It's really cool. Okay, so guys, this was the Bohr model. This is the kind of stuff that he knew but as we learned before, it wasn't complex enough. So then what Schrodinger did is he introduced another number, which was the sublevel number L. So energy levels are broken into sublevels. How many sublevels is an energy level broken into? And the answer is N. The number of sublevels in an energy level is N. That's really confusing, right? It'll make sense in just a minute. But guys, these sublevels have names. They are named S, P, D, and F. Hey, that's familiar. Guys, they are named S, P, D, and F. These are the sublevels that are then made of orbitals. So guys, let's come back then to this idea. Energy levels are broken into sublevels. The number of sublevels in an energy level is N, and they're named S, P, D, and F. So guys, what does that mean? Follow my fingers. Ready? How many energy levels are there? Seven. Energy levels are broken into sublevels. So energy level number one can have one sublevel. It's an S. Energy level two can have two sublevels. Get it? S and P. How many sublevels can energy level three have? Three. And what are they? S, P, D. Now, guys, how many sublevels can the fourth energy level have? Four. What are they? S, P, D, and F. Now, here it gets tricky. Fifth energy level can have how many sublevels? Five. What are they? S, P, D, F, G. But, guys, we don't have atoms that are complex enough to need the G sublevel. We know what it looks like. We've done the math. We've just never seen an atom that has it. So, guys, what we do is this. First energy level, one sublevel S. Second S and P. Third SPD. Fourth SPDF. And then the fifth, sixth, and seventh only have SPDF as well. We don't do the G's, the H's, and the I's because we've never had atoms big enough to need them. Okay. So, guys, that's it. And, guys, again, I know this is crazy. 
If you can do the homework, you're okay. Now, sublevels are broken into orbitals. Orbitals are the clouds, but these clouds can only contain two electrons. Now guys, this brings up a problem. So these are the shapes of the orbitals in the sublevels. And in those orbitals, we have two electrons paired up. Do you see the problem with that? Electrons paired up. Why don't they want to do that? They're the same charge. They're negative in the same way protons want to get away. Because electrons want to get away from each other, but they pair up in orbitals. The question is, how does that happen? And the answer is not the strong nuclear force. Guys, the answer is this. Oh. Oh, my board shut off, sorry. The answer is this. Guys, it has to do with what is called spin. As if electrons couldn't get any more weird. You ready for this? <laughs> this is really hard to do. Pray for me. Okay, so, guys, electrons have a negative charge, yes? But electrons are also magnetic. Just like the Earth has a north and a south pole, so do electrons. And just like the Earth, these electrons spin around their north-south pole. Crazy, right? But guys, here's the deal. Let me grab some magnets to show you. So guys, if we've got two magnets, and if we bring them together, north pole to north pole, what are they going to do? Repel. But what if one of them flips over? Then they attract, right? Guys, that's exactly what electrons do. When two electrons pair up in an orbital, they do repel because they're both negative. But what happens is, is one of the electrons flips over. And then they have an attraction, north pole to south pole, and that lets them buddy up in an orbital, even though they're still both negative. So guys, we call that spin. Let's see if I can do this. So here's what happens. Up, up, my finger is pointing to north. So both of these electrons, before they pair up, are spinning clock, well, they're spinning this direction, that would be counterclockwise about about their or about their poles what happens is is when they pair up they don't change the direction of their spin but one of them flips over so this <laughs> this one is still going counterclockwise but this <laughs> try it this one is now spinning clockwise because it flipped over and if you take counterclockwise and flip it over it becomes clockwise let me show you. Guys, it actually looks like... Oh, my board is still shut off. Guys, it actually looks like this. When electrons line up, they line up north pole to south pole, um, and then it looks like they're spinning in opposite directions because they're oriented differently, and this allows them to pair up. So, guys, this is the way we talk about this. We talk about this as as spin up and spin down so in order for electrons to pair up in an orbital they must have opposite magnetic poles and we call that up and down so <laughs> it's so hard so hard. So, guys, here's where we are. You should understand at a deep, meaningful level why the Bohr model doesn't work, why Heisenberg, how Heisenberg demonstrated that the Bohr model was asking the wrong questions, and how Schrodinger's probability model is a better description of electrons. That should sit well with you. Guys, this should be crazy at best, garbage at worst. But guys, the deal is this. 
If you can answer these homework questions, trust me, you're good. So, guys, let me get these in your hands. Let me set the stage for you, and then we'll get to work. Don't put your class notes away. Brandon, would you mind passing that down to Nora? Thanks. All right. So, guys, here's the deal. This is front and back. But when you do this homework assignment, guys, make sure you have your class notes with you. And also this. Guys, do not make the mistake of coming in here Thursday without having done this. If you haven't done this homework assignment, Thursday is going to be a train wreck for you. But guys, here's the deal. This stuff down here at the bottom of your notes, guys, this stuff is all of this stuff in word form. Everything down here about energy levels, sublevels, orbitals, and spin is this. It's just not visual. And that's what we're going to do on Thursday is we're going to take those notes from the bottom of your page today and we're going to turn them into this. And guys, it's going to change the way you look at stuff for the rest of your life. It's pretty cool. So guys, we're going to work now on the homework. Um, guys, let's just transition into this. I'll put the answers up on the wall. You have 20 minutes. We're going to skip the pledge. Um, let's get this done before you leave. Okay. So guys, dig in and let's get cooking. Um, Nate, I need, and also um, Brandon, I need your guys' flame test labs, please. All right, guys, let me print the answers. <laughs>